Hello, good evening. Thank you for joining us here in the Gladys Davis Theater for our evening with Vanessa German. My name is Heather Harris, and I am the Art Museum of WVU's Educational Programs Manager. Uh, first, a few housekeeping details. This is a hybrid event, so we do have folks listening online. Um, for those of you online, feel free to use the Q&A function. I will be monitoring it, and I'll come back up and um, speak your words into the microphone if you have things to share. Um, and for those of you in this audience, I might repeat some things back into the microphone so that they're audible. Um, I'd like to begin with a land acknowledgement. WVU, with its statewide institutional presence, resides on land that includes ancestral territories of the Shawnee, Lenape, Delaware, Haudenosaunee, including the Seneca, Cayuga, Onondaga, Oneida, Mohawk, Tuscarora tribes, Cherokee, and many other indigenous peoples. In acknowledging this, we recognize and appreciate those indigenous nations whose territories we are living on and working in. Indigenous peoples have been in the land currently known as West Virginia since time immemorial. It is important that we understand both the context that has brought our university community to reside on this land and our place within this long history. We also recognize that colonialism is a current and ongoing process and as scholars seeking truth and understanding, we need to be mindful of our present participation in this process. Now, before I introduce our speaker, I would first like to congratulate all the BFA students whose work is on display, as well as your professors and mentors in the School of Art and Design. Your hard work and perseverance is evident, and we are happy to kick off the celebration with you that will culminate with your graduation next month. Yay. I would also like to thank the School of Art and Design for their support of this evening's program and their ongoing commitment to deep and meaningful collaboration with the Art Museum. Likewise, we would like to thank Judith Gold Stitzel, whose Museum Education Fund makes it possible for us to bring vibrant and important artists of Miss German's caliber to West Virginia University. So thank you. And now, it is my pleasure to introduce you to Vanessa German. A self-described citizen artist, Vanessa's work is grounded in an ethos of love and reflects an unparalleled commitment to community building. Her works are in the collections of museums nationwide, including the Crystal Bridges Museum of American Art, the Nelson Atkins Museum of Art, the Flint Museum of Art, and the Carnegie Museum of Art. Her installation, Reckoning, Grief, and Light, is currently on display at the Frick Museum in Pittsburgh. In 2020, the Art Museum of West Virginia University joined this esteemed list with its acquisition of her sculpture, The Great American Roller Coaster Ride, which is currently on view in our exhibition, True Colors, Picturing Identity, through May 15th. I can say without question that this piece is deeply compelling to our visitors. In the months since the exhibition has opened, I have watched and listened as students and community members have connected with its whim whimsical pose, the myriad of found objects embedded in its composition, and its powerful presence in the gallery. Therefore, I am thrilled to invite Vanessa on stage to further share her work with us. Thanks. Good evening. I'm Vanessa. It's nice to uh, be here on this land with you. Um, this says, I believe in the power of art. I would like you all to just take a moment to consider that which you believe in. Like what does your life prove to be the evidence of your faith? Like if your life could separate itself from your physical body and speak and say, Heather believes in, what would your lived experience say that you believe in? Um, and is it what do you think that the things that you might say out of habit that you believe in are the things that your life would say this person believes in this? Um, just something to consider, but I believe in the power of art, so I'm curious if you would share with me that which you believe in. 
and anybody can start. In, in the power of community. Um, how is this in your life? What's your name? Megan. Megan. Okay, and um, what are the living actions of that power? How, how is the power being powerful? When you say this, And this is a, a new awareness for you. Come back from pandemic? Come back from? Is this about money? Maybe. Okay. Do, do you all understand what Megan's saying? This is clear to you? Who, does anybody not understand? Does anybody? Okay. Um, who, here, who else here believes in the power of community? Who else has experienced the power of community as experientially? Okay. Um, all right. Thank you. Uh, anybody else? Do you believe in the power of? Hi, love. What's your name? Amina. Hi, Amina. How are you? I'm great. I'm happy, I'm happy that you're here also. Say this again. Of legacy. Will you give an experiential evidence of this power? Thank you, Mina. You, it's okay. You can just come in this side. It's okay. No, it's all right. Please. No, it's okay. It's okay. Everybody say hi. We see you. Uh, one more. Yes. Um, we, will you tell me? how you uh, experience this power of love? I couldn't really believe that there was a honey 
experience, what's your name? I, Jenny? Jenny. This uh, experience of like explosive love, of filling up, of like abundant um, love taking over you. Has anybody else here have that experience? Um, is there anybody who feels like they maybe haven't had that experience? Look, you don't have to say. It's a very intimate question um, in multiple publics. Um, <clears throat> thank you for sharing. Um, who would like to start our talk with performance and come and sit in one of these chairs? You would self-select. Um, we, so one, two, three, at some point we'll get to all three of you, but we're going to start with you. <laughs> Not yet. Don't do it yet. Don't do it yet. Hi, what's your name? I'm Jovana. Jovana? Yeah. Where are you from? I'm from Slovenia. So, Europe. Yes. <laughs> Um, are you an artist? Are you a student? Yeah, I'm an exchange student. Yes, and you're making art? Yeah. What kind of work do you make? Um, well, officially it's not a graphic design, mm -hmm. but here I'm doing way more like hands-on stuff, which is, I love ceramics, screens making, I do also painting here. Yes. I like, I like many things. I yes. I like <laughs> a lot of things. So. Yes, yes, this is good. Hi. Um, I'm going to make a poem for you. Okay. And I want you to give me some ingredients for the poem. Okay? So I'm going to tell you, I'm going to ask you for three specific things. Okay. I'm going to say them very quickly first. Okay. Right? And I want you to feel them. Okay. Just take it in, feel it. Okay. And then um, you can give responses, okay? okay? I'm gonna make a poem for you. It requires three ingredients, a name, a color, and a power. The name can be any name, it can be your name. It should be a name that feels right. It should feel right for you to say it. We need, we need a color. Any color, it should feel right to be said out loud, and the power, the way you think of the power is by dint of this moment happening between us and the multiple publics that you can make something happen. Like this moment is magical, this moment is exacting, this moment has the power to bring forth that which you design and desire. Um, the moment is the thing itself. So you decide. Um, sometimes I've done this with children, and they'll say, I want everyone in the world to have a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Um, or That's they'll say, okay. it can, but it can actually be anything. Okay. Sometimes people just say one word. Sometimes people will say peace, or they'll say grace. Um, but it really should be your choice, and you okay. should feel good about it. So it's a name, a color, and a power. OK, I have a name. Yes. It's Boyan. Boyan? Yeah. Boyan. Boyan, yeah. Is it V or B? B. B. Like bull. Bull. I mean, like B, like bull. Yes. Boyan. Boyan. Okay. Um, orange. Orange. And honesty. Honesty. Yes. Okay. And is there anything else that you would care to say? or to share before we start? I'm good, thank you. Um, do you sing? Oh, not really, for myself. <laughs> okay, I'm very right. good. It's <laughs> okay, that's fair. So stay here, okay? Boyan, orange, and honest. Yes. Mm -hmm. Here. For electric giggling, tickling our noses, fragrance here in the power of the tongue, in the power of the shape, in the power of the truth, in the power of the light, in the power of the marrow of our bones.
songs that we might rise up with this same edgeless confidence of the color orange in its singular orange truth to be alive inside of our singular truth. The difference is that the color orange is never afraid. It is us in our human body, in our bones, in our marrow, in the way that Boyan sometimes might tell a little white lie, or a little green lie, or a little orange lie, a little way to skirt around the pain, a little way to dodge the pain that comes from sometimes just standing awake and alive and effervescent inside of your own honest self in the shape of the day in the way that pain might groove you and move through you and exhaust you and cause you to bend over sometimes in the way that pain attaches itself to shame and makes you want to just lie about things sometimes because it's easier. You know what I'm saying. Sometimes the world makes it very difficult to be yourself the way orange is just always itself. Orange is never looking at green like, you know what? It's so hard to be orange today. I'd like to be blue. Orange doesn't do that. Orange is always like orange. 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 And then sometimes it hangs out with purple. <laughs> and then orange is delighted to be in relationship with purple, but they never want to be each other the way that sometimes we just want to be somebody else. Somebody prettier, somebody thinner, somebody a little less thick around the waist, maybe, I don't know, it's the biscuits, but <laughs> here we are then, in the shape and in the sound and in the presence and in the stand your ground force of the way that orange is always orange and has been since the day of its birth and it has a right to be exactly that, like you and I and her and I and we and all of us could just stand inside of the magnificent chorus of our own truth and not deny it. Why? This is the lesson that you have come to give us today in your presence, coming down from this seat and sitting here and telling us about graphic design, but all the lovely things that you like to make with your hands, these invigorating tasks of ceramics and making little things, sewing perhaps. This is why you are here, to encourage us to stand as bright and true and solid in the wholeness of ourselves as orange dares to do in the springtime sun to show up, to show up. Let us show up in the full-bellied, honest breath of our beings, the way that a marigold in its orange shine makes space for the garden to bloom weed-free. It comes with its own medicinal things, the way each and every single one of us do if we stand in the proof of our own selves, we make space for other human beings to bloom in the proof of their own honest, truthing selves. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. I believe in the power of art, and I believe in the power of love, and I don't separate those things. They are the same thing to me. Um, this is the center of my life, and it's the center of my practice. It is um, the soul of everything that I do as a human being, which means that there are no divisions or barriers inside of my practice. I don't talk about my practice like I clock into my studio and I clock out and I'm singularly inspired by any one thing over here. Like this is about utter wholeness and existence. So when I say I believe in the power of art, when you say you believe in something and it has power, then that power is meant to do things. So I ask you, wh when you believe in the power of something, what are you asking that to do? Right? Carpenters don't just look at hammers and say, I'm a carpenter. They, they pick the tool up. They pick the powerful thing up and they do something with it. Um, I believe in the power of art. This is the work of art that brought me into the truth, into my wholeness as an artist. 
Um, I'm going to go through some of these images at any point. If you want to ask a question, you can ask a question at any time. Um, the presentation that you desire me to give is much more potent than the presentation that I've given at any other place before. We're here together in this moment. If you have a question at absolutely any time, I will take your question or we can talk or you can come up here and sit down and we'll talk your question through and then I'll make a poem about that. Um, this is called Power Figure to Keep Me Alive. It is currently in the collection of Progressive Insurance. Progressive Insurance has one of the um, largest, most radical contemporary art collections in the country. It's private. Um, power figure to keep me alive. I came to a point, I found it very difficult to be whole in this world. I found it very difficult to be my full self in this world. I found it very difficult to be in casual um, social environments and feel safe, um, which is um, the way that I believe the structures of this society want me to feel. They don't actually want me to feel safe. It's not um, financially um, rewarding for black women to feel safe in this world. Like we, it, it behooves us to be destabilized. It beho behooves certain systems for black women to be um, destabilized. We know that poverty is intentional, right? And we know a lot of other things are intentional. There's a lot of background that I'm not gonna give. I'm just going to go straight through things. So um, I came to, it, uh, when I say it was very difficult for me to do this, like it was threatening my life. It was very, I did not want to be alive. It felt very difficult to wake up in the morning. This is in my 20s. It felt very difficult to work for people. And this is not laziness. This is not laziness. This is, um, this is taking in what, um, the world and sometimes school prescribes as a way to be alive and to be whole and to be successful in the world and really um, f experience the attack of that inside of my body, inside of my spirit. Um, and even just being in a world that denies spirit and asks you to like completely separate these parts of yourself, um, these parts of myself. Uh, so I decided to end my life. This is probably 15, 17 years ago. Uh, uh, but before I did, I really um, wanted to try an experiment on myself, which is this experiment, uh, like Lauren Hill has this Unplugged album, and in the Unplugged album, she talks about how she realizes like she was driving head on into a wall, and she was just full speed going into the wall, and at the last minute she realized she could turn the wheel. And so I decided, I was like, I just wanna see what it's like to turn the wheel and so for six months, I gave myself full authorization to just do what felt right. Nobody talked to me when I was a child about how I feel and what feels right. Nobody talked to me when, about making art um, in a way that was about my wholeness, you know? About like, the, you can do this because it feels right. Like we think that's an oversimplification, but if you look at the shape of your life and look at what your days would be like, look at what activities you would do um, and look at, consider the impact of that on the environment uh, is actually a really profound thing to think about doing what feels right. Uh, so every day for six months, I let myself do what feels right, but I didn't know what felt right because I had been so far away from that for so long. I tried to do what the world told me was right for me to do. Um, like I, I, I have a high school diploma. I don't have a college degree. People told me that I would be a loser, um, literally. If I did not go to college, I never actually wanted to go to college. I always felt like information was infinitely available, either at libraries or in close proximity to somebody else who had that information. I felt like I could talk to people and I could discover things and I could adventure and journey with other human beings into areas of grand wisdom that didn't require me. I was very afraid of debt. I was really afraid of like signing a lot of loans and I was afraid of the way people who had graduated college and university talked about debt and talked about this like kind of separation of themselves. Like that was frightening to me as an 18 year old because I thought what is life gonna be like if you live your life in service of debt? Um, it was very scary to me. So I went to college for, I don't know, a couple of, I don't know how many semesters, but I needed to know my own mind, so I went to school. I was homeless at the time, and I would sleep in the library, and I couldn't afford anything, so I couldn't buy school books, and I would just 
if there was a history course I was in, I figured there were other people other than the book I was supposed to buy that wrote about that same history, so I would just go to the library. Um, and I made Dean's List as a homeless college student, and that let me know that I had a mind, and that I had real resilience, and I had the ability to, um, like, move, you know, that I had intellectual process that I could count on. Um, but I did come to a place where I was like, I don't know how I'm going to sustain my life really in this world. So every day for six months, I let myself do whatever felt right. I didn't know what felt right because I tried to fit into a lot of different places. This is a public service announcement for fitting in to yourself, whether you're 42, whether you're 85, whether you're seven, um, to listen deeply, 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 deeply to the inside of the inside of the inside of yourself because that is um, the truth that is in greatest connection to the simultaneity of time, the past, present, and the future. Um, that's the gift of your life. So do do that like deep excavation inside of the inside of the inside and do that listening. And before the universe can affirm that, before teachers or other people will affirm that, sometimes you have to be your own voice of affirmation, which is what I had to do. So every day for six months, I would just walk around my neighborhood in Pittsburgh. I would walk my dog and I would pick trash up off the ground that was art supplies to me. And in this image, you see some of the things I just picked up off the ground, whether they were pennies, the electric cord from an old iron, keys. I let myself be attracted to things. I let myself give, I let myself live in the space where I didn't have to know why. I didn't have to say, I'm going to use this ironing cord for this reason. I'm going to use this penny for this. I, it wasn't architecture. I let myself gather materials in my own frequency of yes. So if something felt right to me, then I picked it up and I would use it. And I didn't need to know why, because I didn't have anybody to answer to. But with those materials every day, um, and this is the only thing that it made me feel like waking up in the morning. This is the only thing that made me feel like staying alive. So I did it, and I walked my dog, and I would go down to this little basement, and the first thing I'd do, I would find wood. I couldn't afford wood, so there's all these um, uh, vacant lots and abandoned houses and places where houses were recently demolished, and I found that I could find incredibly wood, incredible wood in old demolished houses. You could find old wood. You could find real two by fours, because you know like the wood you buy now is not actually two by four, but you could find real two by fours. You could find beams that were, were from old growth forests, right? And if we listen to the poetry of trees, if we read poets and what they said about trees, if we read what Rumi says about trees, we read what Mary Oliver said, we read any, you know, any indigenous lore about trees, we know that the trees are giving something to us. We know that the trees are wise. We know the trees are the largest biomass on this planet. We know that trees have something to give us. So you could find these old beams from old gross trees and I felt like the richest person in the world and it was all free so I would gather wood and I would go down to my basement and I would just stack wood until it felt right. I would just find positions of wood. I would lean things and I would just train myself to respond to all of the aesthetic agreements that equaled rightness in the material, right? So I made this work and this one really kept me alive because I put those beads on the face one bead at a time. And that really kept my hands busy. So it takes you into that state of flow, right? It takes you into that state that we know human beings have entered into intentionally, whether it's monks moving one grain of sand at a time or one grain of rice. But there is a physical process then that allows intellectual release and then allows you your nervous system shifts. And then you go in physiologically into a different realm, right? And so this is old, this is old human technology. This is human beings before this language. This is very, a very, very old way of entering into the medicine of yourself, right? It, entering into the medicine of being, entering into human technology. I didn't know this at the time. I just knew that I had to keep my hands busy. Who else has been here? Thank you for acknowledging this. Thank you for acknowledging this, loved ones, right? 
because we are not alone in this experience. We are not alone in the experience of isolation. We are not alone in the experience of separation from our own humanity. And we are not alone in the experience of needing to find out why we're alive for ourselves. You know, I was at a funeral yesterday for a 15-year-old, and somebody kept telling the kids what to do, like all these grieving children. Go, oh, you have to do this, you have to do that, you have to do this, you have to do that. And I was like, it might behoove you to tell them that they can figure that out for themselves, and that you'll guide them, and that you'll hold their hand and you'll be with them. But what, what you did to figure it out might not be what they need. But to return to a place where we can offer one another guidance on this journey, because I was very alone in this, but thank you all for affirming that you've been through something like this also. So this work really did keep me alive. This is how I came into the language of power figure. This is how I came into the language of, if I could make a work of art that had the power to do anything, what would I want it to do? I want it to keep me alive. I didn't want to die, but I was really suffering in the daily. Anybody feel comfortable sharing if you have suffered in the daily? right? The, the daily. It's just, it just happens in this world. Thank you for making the space by saying that, for making other people, giving other people permission to acknowledge that for themselves and to go on that journey for themselves, right? So um, power, I, um, when I would be down in my studio and doing what felt right, this is the first time I gave myself permission to just listen to the same song over and over and over again. Like I thought, you know, I, there were all these ideas in my head about how to live and how to be and how to make art and what to do. Like I heard a poet once say, I don't listen to music while I'm writing poetry because I don't want the music to influence the poetry. So I was like, I can't, I gotta make art in silence. <laughs> but when I did what felt right, I would just listen to the same thing over and over again. It would become part of the ecosystem of the studio, become part of what I was breathing in. And it was okay for it to become part of the art. Like I'm sure Miles Davis is fine that his music helps us go. You know, I'm sure Beyonce is good with her music helping us be, right? So I'm in the studio and I would listen to Dr. King's speeches. Somebody gave me a box set of Dr. King's speeches and I would listen to his voice and I was like, why does his voice sound so different? Like when King says, and you feel it, right? Like when King would say, oh, I have a dream today, and I'd be like, other people have said the word dream, but it didn't feel like this. Like, why do I feel? And I realized that what Dr. King knew is that he was love. So when Dr. King said, I believe in the power of art, uh, he, when it, Dr. King gave uh, the, what they call the love your enemy speech after, you know, Emmett Till, right? Mind you, I think about what our Andrade Roy says about violence and communities moving into violence. When something happens, she's like, I can't tell people not to set something on fire. I can't tell you that that's wrong. I can't tell, you that I can't tell people to do that because I'm not, I haven't endured what they endured. I can't from the outside say that. And so I think about after Emmett Till was killed, how people wanted to like lose their minds in the chaos and in the rage and in, in that. But Dr. King said, you know, you could, kill people every day, but it doesn't kill the lie. You know, he's like the only way that we will get someplace new is love. Love is the only way. Love is the only creative, redemptive, transformative power in the universe. And I realized that Dr. King allowed himself to become that. And so when I would listen to his voice, I would think, oh, I'm not just listening to words like this is love. This is love and this is loving. Um, and so I realized that my entire practice could be love and could be loving, and that's how I live my life. I have found the power of love because it saved my life, it saved my body, it saved my heart, it opened my heart, it let me realize that I had access to my heart. Nobody talked to me as a young person about my heart, um, but I definitely was suffering with a scarred heart and a broken heart, and nobody ever told me that my, nobody ever talked to me about that. It was a very, very separated world. This is when I became a citizen artist. This is when I decided that the center of my life would be love, it would be art, it would be creative understanding, redemptive, transformative goodwill, and that I would inhabit, the first part of the definition of citizen is inhabitant of, that I would inhabit my life this way. 
Um, and because uh, when something is powerful, you do something with power. You do things with it. You know, like you don't have a Porsche and never push it above 45. <laughs> you don't. You do something with it. And if you can't do it here, you find a place to use the power. You find a place to move with it, right? And um, I just thought, well, I don't have a lot, so I'll just be right where I am. And what I found to do was just to share. I would just share. Uh, this is my friend Julia. I love you, Julia. Uh, this is the alleyway behind my house in Homewood. It's uh, called Fumosa Way. It's what they used to call the killing fields. There's an um, old Rachel Maddow show where Rachel Maddow is walking through Homewood with our city council and he's saying killing fields. There were row houses on both sides of the alleyway. The row houses fell into blight and people would hot cut holes in between the walls of the row house. So you could run from the police without being on the street. You could run through all of these row houses at once because there were holes cut between them, but people also hide bodies in there. It's called the killing field. Um, that's where Julia is standing right now. And um, this is my neighborhood. This is the neighborhood I live in. Um, and uh, this photo was taken the year Mike Brown was killed in St. Louis, right, in Ferguson. And what I found was people on social media, I'm not sure if y'all remember this, but people, mostly I experience young black people being like, I don't want to go to work today. It's too hard to go to work. I don't want to leave the house. I would see on social media people being like, I have to go to work. Like, they're not going to understand. I can't call in grief today. I can't call in devastated today. I can't call in heartbroken. I have to go to work, and it's hard. I have to go to Starbucks, and nobody else is suffering like me. Like, people were saying stuff, and I was like, Wow, and so what I would do is I would go through my Facebook feed and I would look and see who was saying things like that and I would invite them. I would say, oh, I made it up. Listen, I really didn't make this up at first. I said, I'm shooting a photo series and it's called The Blacks. And I was just like, literally the first time I did it, I was just improv. I was like, it's called The Blacks and um, um, I'm gonna make some clothes for you. So if I photograph you, how do you wanna feel in the photographs? And you know, Julia's like, I wanna feel like a riot. I wanna feel like the queen of a riot or something. And I was like, okay, so I made these clothes and I made jewelry. That's, a, that's not a made piece of jewelry. That's a, that's a bought piece of jewelry. And what I would do is I would sit the person in my kitchen and I would play certain music, I would light incense, and I would very carefully touch them. I would do their makeup and I would put clothes on them and there was all this intimacy. And then I would take them out of the house into the street and we would walk through the neighborhood and we would take photographs. And this little boy was riding this little dangerous motorbike um, through the neighborhood and he stopped and he looked at Julia and he, his friend was in front of him Woo! His friend was in front of him, and he looked at his friend, and he goes, is there an angel in the field? He said, I think, I think, I think there's an angel back there. And I heard him, and I was like, oh, my God, what's that? And I said, no, you know, that's not an angel. That's Julia. Um, would you take a picture with her? And he said, yeah. Like, look at his face. See, he looks a little confused, right? Because he really had a moment. And I was like, this is a real person, it's Julia. And so they took this image. But I would walk people through the neighborhood um, and allow the spectacle of the beauty to disrupt the sorrow, to disrupt the momentum, to disrupt the day, just to see like a parade of like beautiful people moving through your neighborhood and people would stop their cars and take pictures and you know all the people I photographed felt like models and it would just be like a parade of three and people would stop and celebrate and this is what it is to be a citizen artist for me to bring the work into the living realm and to allow it to do work the work has something to do how many artists here know that your work has work to do 
how many artists need to consider that, that your work has work to do? Your work can have work to do. You can decide intentionally that you want the work to do something. Uh, this is me on the street in up, up on Hamilton Avenue. And I would, uh, that's a sheet, that's a bed sheet. This photograph is called Gun with the Wind. And um, best artist talks, conversations, taking small discrete objects that I made out into the street and just walking around with them. And I would get them on the bus. I would ride the bus with them and people would be like, is that voodoo? <laughs> that's what adults would say and children would be like, Um, so that's what citizen art is to be. This is how I got there. I got there because I almost died. And then, mind you, it's all an adventure. Mind you, I'm an expert in only adventuring and figuring things out one breath, one moment at a time. Uh, so let's look through what some of the rest of this practice looks like and thinking about practice and purpose. Thinking about practice and purpose. Thinking about practice, purpose, and process as the same thing. What is that to think about practice, purpose, and process as the same thing as the thing itself? So these are black Madonnas that I paint. This is an 1890 copy of Anna Sewell's Black Beauty, a book about a horse, thinking about my body, the black woman's body, um, as the workhorse, thinking about the labor, the physical labor of the black woman's body. I am um, a descendant of enslaved Africans, and so there are things inside of me that I don't know. Like, I, I didn't, there were ways that I want to work that I don't always understand. I don't understand what wants to come out and what wants to come through, but I started, I appropriated this copy of Black Beauty um, because there was the ways that I needed to authorize my own love for my own self, for my own body, deeply, purposely, this is the practice, this is the process. Every single one of them brings me more into my own wholeness because I definitely live in a world where um, I started to notice as a very small child that there were no happy black people on television. I started to notice very, very young um, when I would watch Saturday morning cartoons that there were um, not, no black kids playing with the new things and there were ways that I found that um, the absence of black joy and the absence of black love in the media realm was starving me, was really devastating to me. And I was, that was not a devastation that I felt uh, particularly allowed to articulate because whenever I would talk about my blackness or my body um, in any environment with black, other black people, um, with white folks, with, I grew up in Los Angeles, so I grew up around a lot of other people. Um, there was always, uh, there was so much silencing. There was so much, you should just be happy. There was so much oh that's not a real thing there was so much well Whitney Houston is here there was so much well there's this one thing and there wasn't space make space for whatever it is that you have to say that is true for you because that space is also making space for somebody else so in the alleyway out behind the art house this is I went from making singular discrete objects like that one you saw in Gun with the Wind to making entire communities of objects um, in loving honor of the Buddhist monk trick tri uh, tri uh, Thich Nhat Hanh, uh, the idea, he said, the next great revolutionary leader will not be a single individual, but it will be an entire community of people. It will be an entire community of people. So I make communities of sculptures now. I don't make anything one to, at a time. And I work on, right now in my studio in Asheville, there are 16 works in progress. And they're all in communication, right? This is from a body of work called I Come to Do Violence to a Lie, to the Lie. Thinking about how Dr. King said you can kill people. You kill all the people, but it doesn't kill the lie. How do you actually kill the lie? How do you kill the lie of white supremacy? How do you kill the lie that because a woman wears a short skirt, she's asking for it? How do you kill those things? How do you devastate those kinds of lies? You suffocate them to death. You, you create rooms where there's no space for them to expand their lungs any longer because the truth occupies that space. But the first space that is, is inside of us. It is an invisible space. Um, Sometimes we cannot be with our bodies. I'm making large scale installations because I want to invite people to be citizens alive inside of the space with the work. 
So this installation has an entire soundtrack that goes with it, and it's a soundtrack where people call in to a fictitious radio show called the Sometimes We Cannot Be With Our Bodies radio show. All of this is born from the recognition, as with that Facebook feed, me seeing that what people are trying to do is to express their grief and find relief for it. And they're using social media to do that. They're using anything they can, but they're not knowing that I am trying to express grief and needing relief from it. And um, so this idea of this radio show is that, like, let's say, like, Trayvon Martin. Trayvon Martin um, was killed by George Zimmerman after George Zimmerman called 911 and the 911 operator said, do not get out of your car. Sir, we have it. Sir, do not get out of your car on a rainy night. You see a black kid in a hoodie, with me, so it's raining, you know, and he got out of his car, and um, we know what happened. But what happened after that was the hoodie thing. What happened after that was people on Fox News, people on different things being like, look how scary a hoodie is. Wouldn't you get out of your car too? It was actual newscasters putting on a hoodie and being like, look at this, isn't this frightening, right? So they're trying to make this child worthy of what happened to him. When we all know the 911 lady was like, sir, stay in your vehicle. Sir, stay in your car. And the child is dead. And then what happened after the death of that child, nobody's saying, dude, why didn't you stay in your car? What kind of madness is this? They're like, look at this child. He smoked a little bit of weed. <sighs> he, well, he smoked the weed. You got to kill him. He smoked the weed and he had hoodie and he had skittles. You got to kill a child who's doing that. That's murder. You got you to gotta save yourself and take this child out, right? but Trayvon Martin was really handsome. You really remember that? And so what you have in the Sometimes We Cannot Be With Our Bodies uh, radio show is families, friends, and loved ones calling into this radio show to say, you know, my son really liked girls. You know, the world don't know that, but he loved, he loved cologne. And he wanted to make an impact. He was pretty. He was pretty, you know? And so they come to, the radio show fills in the life, right? But all of those phone calls are mixed down with Chicago style house music. So when you're in this installation, we're inviting the viewer to not just be a viewer, we're inviting the viewer into a living experience where they're hearing these stories, but they're also invited to dance with them, right? And I think about Intozaki Shange for colored girls who considered suicide when the rainbow was enough where she said, we gotta dance to keep from dying. We gotta just, just keep going, don't stop. If you stop dancing, you're gonna fall down. And so we're inviting people into that experience that they're seeking through social media, which is to express their grief and relieve it, right? And so this installation invites people to be fully awake, alive citizens. So when we do this at different places, sometimes I hide another performer in with the crowd and you'll be in this installation and somebody next to you will just start singing. There's somebody who walks through the audience in this show with Kleenex. A lot of times it's a drag queen, she'll have Kleenex and she'll give you, cause people cry, cause you start to realize what you're listening to. Like it hits you. Like they talk about in this, they talk about Venus Extravaganza, if anybody's seen the film Paris is Burning, you hear them talk about her and it just sort of starts to hit you, you start hearing names. And I've seen people freeze and they'll be like, I didn't know. They're like, you should post a warning that people are gonna hear these things. Um, but there's somebody who walks around, they'll offer you Kleenex, and there's benches in the installation, and somebody will sit with you, and they'll hold your hand. That's literally what can happen. So we invite into the fullness and wholeness, because we're thinking practice, purpose, and process. It's all alive. Something's happening. There's something to be exacted here. What time is it, please? Huh? Thanks. Um, I'm going to show you some more images. Does anybody have any questions? And we're going to end, and I'm going to make a poem for my friend here, and I'm going to make a poem for my friend here. What's up? You have beautiful hands. What's that about? I can tell from here. Is that something that you hear? You do, don't you? I can tell. You're about to be humble. Oh, well, they're just...
She probably goes to order coffee like, I would like to get, <laughs> I'd like to get a mocha. <laughs> My teacher, I'm turning in my paper. <laughs> What's your question? You would like a poem, okay. One, two, three. We're gonna close with some poems. Anybody else have another question? What's up? Yes. Um, and when I'm, I envision my work in people's homes. I don't always envision it in people's houses because I want it to be a part of their living world. I want it to be a part of what makes their life bearable. I feel like sometimes existence can be unbearable. I feel like sometimes the pace of this world can be difficult and we do our very best. Kids do their very best to be in their first class by 734 when the bell rings. Um, and I think about the invisible assistance we have and like, I think about, so I think about the work in people's homes. I imagine, like, if you had a power figure in your house, where would it be? Would it be by your front door? Would it be in your kitchen? Where would you, where would you need it to be? And I think about them as living objects. So sometimes I tell people, you know you can add things to this, right? You know that if your grandma dies and she gives you the pearl earrings and you're not really a pearl earring wearer, you can put them there and you can add to it. It can be a place of living reverence. It can be a place where you invite the power of that into your life. So I actually imagine them in people's homes. Um, and I recognize, I have some works that are, uh, will be placed as entire installations. That does exist. Well, this is really quick. This is the art house. This is, I'm just gonna go through these kind of quick because it's gonna make me kind of sad today. Um, I make these signs. Stop shooting, we love you. Uh, art house. People, everybody in the neighborhood worked on it. This is Mr. Greg. People are so proud of the little E, the little F that they made. Um, all of this has to be redone. The art house caught on fire in Valentine's Day of last year. The artist in residence left candles burning. As the house says we are all here together, I figure that's the longest continually running truth for anything on the planet Earth, that we're just here together. Um, this is the day, what's happening here? This is not planned. Boxes got delivered of signs and, and I was taking a sign out to give one to my neighbor and cars coming up the street, buses, the bus drivers would lean out and be like, could I get a sign? And people on the bus would be like, can I get a sign? So there was kids in the neighborhood were just running and giving signs to people on the bus, like take seven signs to that bus. And it just happened. We didn't plan this, but there were some kids who they're used to making art at the art house. So they started using the signs to paint on. They made that choice, like that just happened. But what happens when you put the, so when we, when I believe in the power of art, when you ask what you believe in to do the thing you most need to be done, you do not have to engineer the outcome. You do not have to machinate or manipulate the outcome. Put it into the space, put it into action. That's why Megan believes in the power of community. That's what it is. That's the power. You put it into action, you put it into space, and you don't have to say this is what's gonna come from it. You let it do its work. You don't have to convince the Porsche. just dance parties at the end of art house because it can be devastating sometimes you know so we would just dance uh this is parents coming into the art house making stuff and being like i forgot what it was like how good it feels to make things that's the end of the slideshow but we'll end it with zoe uh okay i know we just have the time that we have left um can you two come down first can you come 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 so one of you decide who's going to sit in the chair first, and one of you, are you abdicating yours? Okay, come, 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 come. What's your name? Say it one more time. Let me see your hands. 
turn around. <laughs> do this. <laughs> now do this. Now do this. <laughs> now do this. <laughs> now ask for what kind of coffee you want. Can I have a mocha? Yes! <laughs> All right, okay, have a seat. Um, why do you want me to make you a poem? Why are you apologizing? What happened? Oh, I, I don't know. I, I feel nervous. I'm trying to like calm down. It's okay to be nervous. Be with your nerves. Okay, but I just, I'm doing this right now. Um, I'm glad. I my mom in the car how I've been meditating. I had like a little breakdown yesterday, and I was like writing to myself in my journal, and I was just like so proud of myself because I just have been like, so proud of myself because I controlled my emotions. In the past, I've had like my emotions came over me so hard, and I could never control them. But mm -hmm. I was just so proud of myself yesterday because I controlled my emotions so well, and I just feel as if like my feelings. I'm starting to understand myself more. And Thank you. Sorry about that. Thanks. Thank you. understand my feelings more and love my inner child. How, what is your age? 16. Yeah. Um, has anybody else here <laughs> take my a moment? tomorrow. Happy <laughs> birthday. Thank you. <laughs> right. Will you be 17 or 16? Yes, I'll be 17 tomorrow. Okay. So really quickly, um, tell everybody your name again. McKinley. McKinley. Has anybody else here felt reason to be proud of themselves this week. Um, taking a moment with McKinley to just celebrate that for you, because uh, who here has had some moments this week that they're not proud of? Right? So let us take a moment to just celebrate quietly that you made it. You ready? Yeah. So the same thing. We need a name, we need a color, and we need a purpose. By dint of this moment, anything you can bring forward, it is powerful. The name should feel right, the color should feel right. Okay, I'm gonna go with my name, McKinley. Um, McKinley. The color gold, and good color. the word good. beautiful. Yes, okay, great, thank you. Mm. Okay, okay. All right, okay, yes. We are so joyful for you, okay. This joyful, this joyful, this bright leaping press of joy into the sky of your life and your heart and your soul and your being and this sunrise of brightness that is the life force that is walking around inside of you this very instant we say yes to the gold of your eyes and yes to the gold of your work and yes to the golden bright shine of the voice that is rising up and finding you inside of this moment in this very instant you are all full of holiness the way that the ocean is full of water you are carrying with you the abundant roar from shore to shore these oceans waving of luminous gold rising up and carrying every cell of your body from moment to moment to moment to moment the resource is the wholeness is the truth is you standing alive and awake and bright inside of the permission that you can be alive and awake inside of the beauty that is you. You say, I am. You dare, 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 you dare to say, I am. How are 
my self. I am a celebration of every sister, mother, brother, cousin, auntie, every ancestor whose legacy is living inside of me, inside of this very instant. Every time I open my eyes and I smile, I am rising up in the ovation of my own triumph. I am whole and beautiful in every single state and condition of my being. I am an entire instrument of beauty, being beauty, being holy, truly, me, myself, I bring this truth to you right here, right now, in this instant, I see you. Thank you. Happy birthday. You. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Thank you so much. I love you. Be blessed. I wish the best for you. Thank you. I say for you. It's wonderful to meet you. Yes. Can we steal time? Thanks. You ready? Please? Please? Do you still want to come? Do you still want to come? Yes, come, please. How are you? Do you sing? Yeah. What would you like to sing right now? Oh, wow. I'll sing with you. I'll sing with you. Do you know uh, Amazing Grace? Something simple. Just choose something simple. Or I choose what's in your heart. Grace. You can? Yeah. Who here needs some grace? <laughs> Who here finds life a little chunky right now? <laughs> it's a little weird. Who here <laughs> knows what day of the week it is? It's Thursday, I think. Sure. <laughs> in the car earlier, it was Friday. And then it came back, and it was like, oh, it's Thursday. It's a little chunky being alive right now. Let us bring some grace into the room. I will sing with you. We will okay. sing together. Mm. We shall make a poem. Yes? Okay. Thank you, love. You want me to start? Hold my hand really quick. Okay. Oh my gosh, I haven't sang in front of people in a while. <laughs> okay. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I am found. Was blind, but now I see. Gosh, <laughs> makes you uh, think of church. <laughs> All right. I'm going to make a poem for you. All right. So we need the same thing, a name, a color, a purpose. We're borrowing time, so you know what those things okay. are. You can give me your ingredients. Um, a name, Samuel. Samuel. And a color, red. Okay. And change. It's my word. Okay, yes. Okay, thank you. Samuel, red, change. Um, we would like to know if there's anything else you'd like to say about this name, Samuel. It's my brother. Yes. Okay. Brother. Okay. Here for the heart of Samuel. Okay. Here. Oh, yes, Jenny. Okay. Love. All right. Okay. Here for that volcanic explosive rising up red of the heart on fire through Samuel's chest up to the full moon, this brightness rising, this love that is rising up and consuming each and every one of us, every cell of our body, every eyelash on our eye, every hair on our head from the tip of our toes to the top of our head we rise and we are rolling and flowing in a high tide of love coming forth. Love is our rowboat and we have
have some place to go from the center of the spinning and the spiraling the soul of Samuel oh Samuel this love song is for you it rises up red and it blooms it blooms it blooms if it's raining outside it's raining to water the seeds of love in your heart this song is for you Samuel we sing this love song from WVU to right where you be this love song for the garden of your heart your sisters bringing it to you this love song this love Love song for every rhythm, every heartbeat, every song, every movement, every word, everything that you do, that you bring, that you are, that you were, that you will live holy and fully and truly inside of each and every one of us who heard this song, this name, this garden of love that we have here with us from Jenny's heart to my heart to your heart from McKinley's heart from Heather's heart and Todd's heart and Bob's heart and all of our hearts this is the start of something new I believe in you. You know this. All right. You're welcome. You're welcome. Do you can you sit next to Heather? Can you just yeah. sit here for a second? Thank you. <coughs> Thank you. Um, there was one we before. One more. Are we done stealing time? What's your name? P hat? Yeah. What? Hey, Joe. Do you need to go? Because I don't want to keep you. <laughs> OK. Um, so Amina, are you coming? Because if not, we can talk later. I figured <laughs> that you belong to each other. Yes, thank you. All right, thank you all so much. Thank you, everybody who shared. Thank you, everybody who answered, who answered questions physically and you raised your hand to things because that honestly does make space. It, that honesty opens up the frequency and makes available for us to all stand up and raise our hands inside of what's true for us. Um, thank you all for being citizen artists here with me, for creating here with me and for keeping me alive. I hope that something from this moment becomes a part of you, becomes a part of your practice, your process, becomes part of you um, committing to that which you believe in and allowing it to do that which you most believe needs to be done. I thank you gratefully and fully from my whole heart. I'm giving this thanks long, this gratitude long, because I do know chances are I will not ever meet any of you or see any of you again, but I'm grateful for your presence and I'm grateful for this time here. And I wanna thank everybody who made it possible for me to be here. It takes a lot of emails to make things like this happen. Um, and so I thank you all. And for those of you who are artists here, I do hope that you are giving yourself full permission at some point in your practice to do whatever you want to do, especially if you're working on assignments a lot. Please enjoy that. Thanks, y'all.